Um, my name's Sue Parnell. Um, I'm a professor of geography. I'm an urban geographer um, based at the University of Cape Town. And um, I'm also part of something called the African Centre for Cities. What I thought would be useful for us to, to pick up on is how we look at cities. Um, and in a way to think about the issue of theory um, and then perhaps um, also to think about the value of looking at history. We need to know what theory is as well as what different theories there are. And different ideas have got very different origins and it's important to train our minds to understand what those differences are because they do make a difference to how we see cities. I find it really important, and, and the reason why it's important for practitioners to understand theory, is that depending on when you were trained <laughs> and where you were trained, you were probably exposed to different kinds of theoretical ideas. Um, and because people, when they are training, often think quite closely about theoretical ideas, they forget later on when they begin to start practicing that those are ideas that shaped how they think. And the big ones would be uh, some of the early ideas about cities which come out of the Chicago School. So the sorts of ideas about modeling which come out of a logic um, of from ecology, actually, of or that there's some kind of state that is, is somehow where you put a pressure here and it relates to a pressure there. And so those old models of cities like Burgess and Hoyt that we some of us grew up on, um, which in some senses predict the overall structure of cities have their origins in ecological thinking. It's a systems thinking. And we've seen a return to that kind of thinking today. So the one that's probably had the most influence in the last 50 years has been Marx. The idea is that there's a central logic of capital and the way that money operates in a system. You have labor and you have capital. And depending on how the, the flows of capital um, Marx talks about very different kinds of processes um, the, which, which impact on cities. So in order to continue to make money, capital has to continue to expand. Uh, but there's also a contradiction because in order to make money for individuals, it's also got to consolidate. Some people like David Harvey then talk about what that means for money. Um, and he ties, and people have worked very systematically following that, people like Neil Smith and others, on, on how that impacts on the city. So basically the idea is that you will get investment in different circuits of capital, different places to put your money, if you like. Um, and so when money isn't flowing through resources and it's stopped making as much profit as it might, it'll switch into the built environment. Um, lots of people critiquing that and saying that's not really very helpful for understanding the informal economy. Some people seeing the informal economy as a separate circuit of capital. Others coming back and saying, no, 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 it's all part of the same system. Other people who would think of as Marxists who have big theoretical ideas, um, or at least kind of some kind of materialists, political economists, if you like, uh, don't focus as much on money, but they focus on the fact that there's a working class, a set of people who have nothing to sell but their labor. So they're no longer agrarian, they no longer depend on the land, but they have to work. And so that was what Engels was really keen on, on talking about. And he, his ideas about how the working class should organize and whether or not they should participate, for example, in home ownership has been probably one of the most influential debates. Um, and this issue of home ownership and its relationship to working class organization um, has been a prevailing idea. So whether we're talking about, if you look at some of the contemporary literature that is, is very influenced by Marxist ideas and continues to be, either because they adopt them or because they're in opposition to them, think of much of the literature on gentrification. Okay, so why do we see reinvestment in particular parts of the city? Very, very different kinds of ideas about that. Tied to that, this question of home ownership. Is this a good idea or a bad idea? So an example of where theory lands. What's most useful for me is to untangle that we have different theoretical ideas so that we don't get confused and have fights. Uh, it's a bit like having different religious views. It helps to know that somebody at the, on the ta in the table is a Muslim and somebody in the table is a Buddhist and somebody in the table is a Jew. Not because 
you're necessarily going to change each other's minds, but because you recognize that the way that you see the world has different starting points. And that enables you to learn from each other sometimes. It enables you to define what you think because you actually do see some things very differently and you don't agree on everything. But also sometimes to see things from somebody else's point of view. Now, history really matters for understanding cities. Some people now talk about a historical turn where there's been a, a growing recognition that actually it's really important to understand the urban past. And it's, it's a very easy case to make um, because it sounds terribly obvious uh, when you say, well, if you're trying to solve contemporary problems and you're trying to make sure that you're going to build better cities for the future, it makes an awful lot of sense to understand how you got to be where you are um, and why the systems which are in place are there um, before you start to change things. So, for example, there's not a lot of work on the history of sanitation or the history of building codes. Um, there is quite a lot of work done in some parts of the world on really interesting questions like the origins of city politics and the mafias which lie behind certain kinds of uh, decisions which get made. So certainly something like the US is extremely well understood uh, in that. The difficulty is, again, when we sit to begin to start trying to understand cities of the global south, and this is where the general question is, is are the theories that we have at the moment up to interpreting the global south? And it's not, there's, there's a big debate uh, about that, that question. But there's no, no, there's absolutely no question that there's insufficient historical material about the places that we are now desperately trying to engage with. We simply don't have the histories in any kind of depth across enough different scales, enough different sectors. We have no record of population change. We don't know when people began to come into the city. We have no understanding um, of who, in fact, the really powerful players are in the city and what the economic base is. We don't know why they managed to get that purchase. And so we start to try and change things. And we begin to start engaging in things where we don't know what the real political dynamics are. So the informal land market is probably the best example of that. And if you think about an Indian city, I'm quite sure that you will know that there are major interests that control large informal settlements that are probably very reluctant to allow development to come in for very particular kinds of reasons. So, and yet we're signing up to new sustainable development goals, which say we're gonna have waste collection, we're gonna have water collection, we're gonna impose a whole bunch of services. But the political ramifications of that can't be anticipated unless you understand the underlying political economy of the city. And that political economy is based not just in the financial systems, but also in infrastructure, in the social systems, in any number of different variables. And so we need a whole horde of histor historians to be out there documenting and presenting that material for us. An even bigger problem is that in a lot of the cities that are undergoing the fastest transition and where poverty is greatest, where inequality is greatest, where there are the most exciting opportunities to change things, it's not just a case of going off to the archives and finding those records because they haven't been kept. We've got to start not just undertaking some in-depth narrative interviews with people, which we must do quickly while our elders are still here, who can tell some of these in-depth stories that we need, but we also need to start protecting the resources about the city and its evolution for future generations. So I'm thinking here about photographs. I'm thinking here that our communications in City Hall are no longer archived because many of them are email. Um, so what are the protocols that we have there in both the formal and the informal spaces? So I would make a very strong call for us to begin to start looking at history.